Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast presented by Dream Cricket. I'm your host, Peter Dalpena, and on today's show, we have one of the youngest players ever to play for the USA women's national team, Geetika Kadali, made her debut as a 14-year-old in May 2019. She's now 17 and trying to help get the USA women's national team back into the Global T20 World Cup qualifier. They've got regional qualifying coming up pandemic permitting and beyond that there's the 50 overall cup qualifier at the end of the year and Gitika Kadali is expected to be a key player for USA both in the year and the long term so you'll hear about her journey on this episode I want to remind everybody that the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast presented by Dream Cricket is sponsored by Moose the Cricket Stadium the first and original turf wicket facility in the state of Texas for more information call 713-534-2195 that's Moose the Cricket Stadium in Pearland, Texas and now this week's interview with Gitika Kadali ahead of the start of the USA Women's National Championships in Florida. Geetika, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Now that I'm talking to a USA National Team representative, uh, one of the youngest ones on on record for USA, you're on the verge of continuing with your USA National Team representation after an extended break. An enforced break for everybody due to the pandemic, unfortunately. But you've been keeping up with your cricket and been a a major contributor in the inter-regionals competition in North Carolina, playing with one of the North Carolina teams. And then also as part of the Eastern Conference squad, and you've just recently been selected to play for not just the Eastern Conference women, but also the Eastern Conference under-19 team. So you've got quite a lot on your plate coming up in the month of August and hopefully beyond when the USA National Team women's squad selection happens. So first off, I guess, what have you been doing to keep busy during the pandemic? Yep, um, the pandemic was a little bit tough because we didn't know what we were practicing or playing for. There was nothing to look forward to for a long time. But I think like I made a group of friends over here that were very passionate about cricket and we've just been practicing together following um, Bird's fitness schedule and we've had virtual meetings through the pandemic that really keep us engaged in team bonding and all of that stuff. Now you say over here, over here means North Carolina for people who are not aware. PT is, is now living in the Raleigh-Durham Chapel Hill area right near Church Street Park in Morrisville, where there's that fantastic facility, in my opinion, the best cricket facility in America. And you get a chance to access that on a regular basis. But you're not actually from the Morrisville, Durham, Raleigh, Chapel Hill area. You're actually from California. You're born in Fremont in the East Bay. And you played basically all of your developmental cricket out there, being involved with the San Ramon Cricket Association and some of the other youth programs out there. So I'm curious, and I'm sure some other people out there are, how did you first get involved in cricket and what drew you to the game? I played a lot of sports as I was growing up. I always like tried new ones, just one season, one sport, and then moved on after that. So I was actually selling my childhood home and my childhood best friend was actually playing cricket in the US. And I had no idea that there was professional cricket here or that there was a national team. And um, I just went out to practice with him and the coach gave me some compliments about hand-eye coordination and all of that good stuff. So I just stuck with it from there. And in the beginning, it was one of those sports where I was gonna play for a season, see if I liked it and then maybe continue. But I just fell in love with cricket from the minute I started. There was just so much to the sport. It was like every single day I was learning something new and I still am to this point there's like a new aspect added on as you progress. Is there one sport in particular or a, a couple of sports that you really enjoyed, I guess, more than cricket that you were deeply involved in before cricket started to take more of your attention away? Um, I didn't enjoy more than how much I enjoy cricket right now, but I did play basketball. I swam a little, did some tennis, soccer, volleyball. <laughs> just keeps going <laughs> so you got exposed to quite a number of of different things to what standard of participation were you were you involved in these other sports 
Uh, they were like outside club sports. So we had a club called St. Joan of Arc. And I think that's just city clubs where we play between cities in the Bay Area. What specifically about cricket again? And as I find this also fascinating from the standpoint that you grew up in a South Asian family, but growing up in America, you can't take cricket for granted. Like you said, you didn't really know it was around you. And if you're a first generation, second generation kid growing up in the U.S., it's not a given that you're going to be exposed to cricket because you've got so many other alternative options through school and through other avenues that you get a chance to participate in. So from that standpoint, what level of exposure, if any, were you aware of with regards to cricket growing up in a South Asian family in California? There were a lot of like backyard cricket games. So like if you hit a car, it's a six. If you hit the wall, it's out. I used to play with my cousins and relatives a lot. Like they would come over and we'd go out to a park, play at a baseball ground and stuff like that. But not a lot of exposure. My dad played cricket when he was younger. So he was elated that I was going into cricket. He was really excited for me. But there was no pressure in that case. But he's always helped me through my journey. And my mom's very supportive, too. So what age were you? You're 17 now. What age were you when you first got a formalized introduction and get involved into a a more formalized structure? I was 11 at the time. I went to Cricket Zeal Academy. They had a practice session there. And I met um, Coach Raghu Borada and... He introduced me. I think he was um, involved with Usaka at that time, and he was the woman's coach. So he introduced me from there, and it was a really lucky introduction because I got to travel with the USA, and I got to see cricket at such a high level just when I was starting to play. You said cricket is a sport that you feel like you've had more fun and more enjoyment out of compared to other sports you played when you were first exposed to other things and you would try one thing out for a year and then move on to something else. What was it about cricket that made you stick with it beyond that initial plan of just giving it a year and then thinking about moving on to something else? It was definitely the competition and the amount of strategies that are involved in playing the game. It's not even, it's not like a, only a physical challenge. It's also a mental challenge. So there's a lot of brain and fitness work going into the game, but just how much it keep, you have to be in the game mentally and physically is what kept me going. You mentioned Raghu Bharata and, and being exposed to the U.S. women's national team environment quite early on. That's not a typical experience for a lot of junior players, girls or boys. Having had that exposure quite early, though, when you did get into cricket, were you already having goals? I want to play for the national team or were you just playing for fun and enjoyment and you weren't thinking big picture? I did, actually. I had very big goals. I gave myself three years to make the team and I wanted to play alongside all of the players that I was watching play against Pakistan when I saw them. (laughs) I think goal accomplished. (laughs) So this series, you're referring to the Pakistan series, this was in Florida, November, December of 2015. At that time, you would have been 13. So again, this is like two years into your journey. You set yourself through a three-year target. You're two years in, you see Pakistan come and play against the U.S., What about that experience do you remember most and what did you take away from that, reevaluating your goals and ambitions on the pathway to try and get to the national team? It definitely exposed me into the professional aspect of the game. It's not showing up to a U13 game like five minutes before it starts warming up on the field. It was a more like a team bus, get to the ground, national anthem plays. It was like a eye opener for me. It was like, this is the level of cricket I want to be playing when I get older. And it exposed me to the team values, the culture. Cricket brings together many cultures. It was something that like tied the two teams that were there together. And I thought that was really cool and something to look forward to. Now, one of the challenges that a lot of junior players face in America, whether that's boys or girls coming up to developmental pathways, is just pure and simple opportunities, finding a place to play, whether that's 
in a senior team or in a junior team, there's not a lot of organized junior cricket anywhere in the country, and especially for girls. As a result of that, oftentimes a lot of girls, if they're trying to get opportunities, they've got to play in boys' teams or play in mixed teams to try and get opportunities to just pure and simple to get match practice. What are some of the challenges that you have experienced and encountered in terms of just getting opportunities to play? And who has helped you from a coaching standpoint or just from a club leadership standpoint to help you make sure that you were getting those opportunities to get on the field and develop in the right way? Um, So opportunities wise, my first year of cricket was with Cricket Zeal Academy and that would be like playing with the guys. It would be mixed and I played in my age group and the age group below me. So that would be U11 and U13 at that time. So I got to play in matches on the weekend. I'd have practice after school and my mom and my dad would have to drive me 40 minutes to an hour to go to practice or matches. But Coach Raghu Borada, Coach Ravi Kari, they made sure I was getting along with the men, the boys, and they just made sure I was getting the opportunities I needed to succeed. And I think a lot of it was also learning. A lot of the 13-year-old boys have been had been playing for a while, and they were really experienced and they knew what they were doing. So I just learned a lot from just standing on the field and watching them talk strategies or watching them talk about where they can hit the ball, who they can bowl to, where the catches are going to come and stuff like that. Practices were also very like crucial. My coaches would make sure that I was batting and bowling every session. And I actually started to pick up bowling faster than batting. I recently started batting or taking my trying to take my batting to another level. So bowling was my main thing back then. And it was actually kind of helpful that the boys couldn't play slow bowling. (laughs) So I was too slow for them, I guess, but it got me wickets. And that's what kept me going. Did you want to be a bowler first or did you want to bat and it just happened that your bowling skills were developing earlier? It just happened that my bowling skills were developing earlier. I think I'm definitely built for bowling, I have broad shoulders, pretty tall. The ball zips when I bowl. So I think I used my height to my advantage at that point, And my bowling was giving me a lot more accomplishments compared to my batting. But I still enjoyed batting from the start. And I definitely did like bowling more than batting at that point. Compared to other sports that you played growing up, I would imagine if you're playing tennis, or you're playing basketball, whether that's in Northern California or other places in the country, those sports at junior level are developed to the point where they've got enough participation level where you're playing with girls only teams. What kind of an adjustment was it for you from that standpoint in terms of growing up playing sports? We had plenty of girls in your peer groups that you would be playing in girls teams versus now going to a sport where you might be the only girl playing and you don't have a choice to but to play with boys if you want to get an opportunity to play? It wasn't a hard change for me. I was always a tomboy growing up. I enjoyed the McDonald's boys Happy Meals toys instead of the girls and um, I think the boys were also very supportive and when we're young we're all talking about the same things like that cartoon movie that just came out or something. So I actually mingled with them pretty well and I we got accustomed to each other and we started hanging out, not just for cricket, but also going to the movies, going bowling, stuff like that. So that change wasn't hard for me and I actually enjoyed playing with the boys because they kept me on my toes. I needed to improve twice as fast as I normally would just to stay on their level. So It was a change, but I appreciated the change. And I think playing with the boys has helped me a lot. You made your USA debut in May 2019. But leading into that, you would have gone to a number of camps and trials in order to get selected in the first place. From that first experience as a 13-year-old being around the USA women's squad in Florida when they were playing against the Pakistan women, until that debut in May 2019. What was the biggest point of transformation in your game that you feel allowed you to grow and develop to the point where you were able to attain that goal that you had set for yourself of getting picked to play for USA? 
I think there was a transformation in my fitness. I started working out and I started challenging the guys instead of being challenged myself. The change that happened really was my mindset. And I really looked like it was getting closer to the end of the three years that I gave myself. It was time to really push. And then I got that email to come for, to try it out for the team. And from there, it was just a very fast process. It feels like yesterday. How did you find out that you were selected for the national team? I was actually helping my um, coach, Coach Clint, with a SRCA tryout. So I was helping little guys and girls hit tennis balls, getting them to drive the ball on a cone. And my parents showed up at the Nets with a cake. So they called my cousins and my friends over. And that's when I found out that I was selected. And I was really happy and excited. And I was there was like a lot running through my head, like, who else made it? Am I going to be having some fun? Is it time to grind, start working really hard right now? <laughs> and stuff like that. Making your debut, just short of turning 15, you get picked to go to Florida for the America's qualifier where USA took on Canada. You're one of the youngest players there. You and Lisa Ramchit were the two teenagers in the team getting to play with senior players who are much more experienced and much older than the two of you. But also, you're two of the few American-born players in the team. And there's there's a huge cultural gap within USA national teams that I've experienced. Even though traditionally a lot of teams have been ethnically South Asian or West Indian, there's a very, very distinct, it's a subtle, but very, very distinct difference in terms of the attitudes and the treatment that players get, whether men or women, who are American-born South Asian versus the South Asian players who are born and brought up in India or in Pakistan and then come and migrate and then become part of the USA national team. And it's not always a very smooth transition and it's not always a, a smooth mix and a smooth team culture in that regard. And it can be quite rocky for the American born players. So from an age standpoint and also from a cultural standpoint, being an American born and raised player, regardless of your ethnic background, what was it like coming into the team environment? It was a pretty nice transition for me. I'd say it was a smooth transition. And I was actually really nervous before the qualifiers. I was intimidated. I was like, how am I going to get along with these experienced players? I, I felt very nervous. And then as soon as I went there, we just bonded as a team. I made a lot of friends, new connections. I'd say probably second family. <laughs> and... I think me and Lisa had a smooth transition and we weren't treated different. I'd say we were just treated as anyone else would be coming into the team. How much of a difference did it make for you in terms of your comfort level having Lisa there as a fellow teenager who was basically going through a lot of the same new experiences at the same time you were compared to how you, it might have gone had you just been a first time debutante without somebody who's kind of in your peer group, in your age group, going through the similar things that you were experiencing at the same time? I'd say it made it a lot more comfortable. It helped knowing that I wasn't the only one. And also, um, Mahika was selected around the same time too. And she, I mean, almost everyone on the team is a child at heart. We always joke around. There's a lot of banter and we have fun. So we fit in right away, but having Lisa by my side was actually really comfortable and helpful. Today's edition of the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast presented by Dream Cricket is also sponsored by Musa Cricket Stadium, the first and original turf wicket facility in the state of Texas, located at 5515 McKeever Road in Perlin, just five miles off the Bailey Road exit from State Route 288, a half hour south of downtown Houston. Musa Cricket Stadium includes fully enclosed locker rooms and change rooms, plus shower facilities after a day's play, as well as outdoor nets for all your training needs. Aside from the main turf stadium ground, there is now a second ground at the facility open for use. For more information, call 713-534-2195 Musa Cricket Stadium in Pearland, Texas. May 19th, 2019, that was your official debut in that series against Canada. That was the third T20 that USA played. USA had already clinched the victory in the series over Canada at that stage. USA went on to sweep the series 3-0, but you played in the third match. You batted one ball, finished one not out, very end of the innings. And then bowling-wise, you bowled three overs, finished with one wicket for nine runs. You dismissed the Canada captain, Mahwish Khan, 
What do you remember most about that day? I remember going onto that field and just taking a look around and taking it all in. I'm pretty sure that one ball I batted, I was definitely trying to get off of strike, <laughs> maintain that 100 strike rate and support our captain. I think she was on the field with me at that time. And it was really helpful that she was on the field helping me on the pitch too. And that one off one did a lot for my confidence coming off of the field and going into bowl after. You mentioned the captain, Sindhu Sriharsha, USA women's captain. That's who you're batting with. She finished 42 not out in that innings. It's a very simple thing, but it can be significant in that situation. Just the fact that you got to go out and bat, got to face the one ball. How much did that impact when you went out to bowl? Just purely from the standpoint that you got to go out in the field, plain and simple, facing one ball, two ball, five balls, whatever. The fact that you just got to bat, get rid of some nervous energy before then being able to go in and focus on your main specialty at that point in time team, which was bowling. It was actually a lot better knowing that I scored my first run. <laughs> it was like a tick for the accomplishments and I was ready to go and get my first wicket at that time. I was just ready to make my mark, I guess. Do you even remember your run or was it a blur? You were so much was happening at the time. You don't even remember what happened. I do remember, actually, it was a it was a full toss, and I did not middle it, but I hit the ball and we took a run. <laughs> you got one in the scorebook. That's what matters in the end. USA dominates in the field. You guys win by 35 runs in the end. I mentioned you took the wicket of the captain, Mahush Khan of Canada. What do you remember most about that first wicket? I was really excited after I got the wicket. I was kind of lost in my celebration. I got her bold. And it was one of the better balls that I bowled that day. And everyone came around me. I'm pretty sure Onika Wallerson picked me up. <laughs> and we were all just really happy and celebrating my first wicket. So USA, by beating Canada in that series, qualified for the global women's T20 World Cup qualifier, which was going to be in Scotland. You get to Scotland and you only get to play one game because you were injured for a good chunk of that tour. You picked up a side strain. Having spent so much time in preparation for that event, getting yourself mentally built up to do as much as you can to help the team, what was it then like for you to go through that injury experience? I was pretty sad at the time. I felt like I worked really hard and then I wasn't going to be able to showcase my skills at the tournament, but I also got a lot of support from my teammates and injuries come and go. And I think it was actually an opportunity for me to learn in the beginning of my cricketing career rather than to the end so it's a learning experience for me and that's how I'm going to take it from now. Just getting a chance to soak up a lot of lessons from the bench and observing things whether strategically or just game management preparation wise what's the number one lesson you feel you took out of that experience? Um, it would be the mindset change when it comes to batting in conditions like those. It was pretty cold a lot of rain a lot of games cut, getting cut short and us having to play eight over games and stuff like that. So just going out there and having the change in intent for batting, whether it's staying long and building a partnership or going out there and trying to hit six sixes for six balls. And I think that's something I really took to heart. And your batting has certainly come a long, a long way. You mentioned focusing on the batting, and earlier you, you touched on the fact that your bowling came along first, but in recent years you've started to take batting a bit more seriously, and that's come out in some of the stats you put up. You scored you know, at least one half century in the interregional matches. What specifically have you worked on in terms of a point of emphasis or point of focus that you feel has allowed your batting to catch up? I worked on my technique when it comes to batting. I was always a hard hitter of the ball. I enjoyed hitting the ball as hard as I could. And then slowly my drive started to come along as I got coaching from Coach Clint, Coach Alvin Colleyturn. He's my batting coach right now, one of the greats. So my technique has improved a lot from there. And just learning about shot selection was a big part, transitioning from being a quote-unquote hitter to playing to score my 50 and playing long innings. You mentioned Raga Barada, Coach Clint, Clint Copeland, uh, also in the Bay Area, and then most recently Alan Kilitron. And to work with Alan Kilitron, you need to move. So your family moved 
from Northern California to North Carolina. What was it like for you getting that kind of support from your parents to enable you to come to a, a part of the country where you, you were going to have access to better facilities? And what has it been like for you transitioning from Northern California and the cricket culture there to the axis and the cricket culture in North Carolina? Um, the transition was pretty smooth, but I was leaving behind a lot of friends that I made from cricket. And like I said, we used to go bowling and hang out a lot. So it was pretty tough. But I actually came here or came to North Carolina for NYCL. So my team from California brought a team over here. So they actually came to North Carolina for my send off, which was pretty nice. And I got to play one last tournament with them and I led them in the U14 tournament. So that transition was pretty rough at first, but now I've made cricket friends here and the grounds and the facilities that I have access to here are just top notch. And I think they're one of the best like you in the country. And I just really appreciate the fact that my family moved across the country and cricket was a big factor in that move. So I couldn't thank them enough for that. And now you're working with Coach Alvin Kilishren, former West Indies International World Cup winner, two-time World Cup winner. What is your favorite Alvin Kilishren story that you can share with us? He's actually a really funny person to be around, always cracking jokes, making everyone laugh. And just the atmosphere that he, like the atmosphere at his sessions is always pretty casual, but you're still working towards fixing things. And he always emphasizes the fact that it's the little things. So for me, when I started batting with him, it was almost like restarting cricket batting. So he made me do some drills where I'm hitting the ball off of a cone or off of the ground. He basically started from the bottom for me. And he brought my batting up to the point where I'm hitting half centuries now. So every session I'm always laughing. And I don't remember one in particular, but he's always fixing things, the little things. And it just helps me every single session I go to him because I learn new things every time. Now, after you came back from the tour with the USA women's team a couple months later, you got a chance to go to Australia, basically right before the pandemic broke out. This is in late January, early February of 2020. You were picked to be part of the Fair Break 11. You and Sindhu Sriharsha were the two USA representatives in the Women's Fair Break Global 11 as part of this invitational series that was held in New South Wales at Bradman Oval. You were captained, I believe, by Sanamir of Pakistan, and there were some other international players in the team, including Sterkhaus from the Netherlands, who's got quite a reputation in the associate scene. So it was quite a mix of players in that group, and you got to be a part of it. What was that experience like for you? I was very excited when I got the invitation. Just going to Australia was one of my answers for the dream vacation questions that we've been asked as we've been growing up. So I was excited to go out there and experience the weather. But then when I saw the pitch, it was like a whole new story because I've never seen the ball bounce that much on a turf wicket when I was bowling before. So it just opened up a whole new world of possibilities for me and just bowling with people from all over the country on the field with me and supporting me. It was definitely a game changer in terms of my mindset and seeing where other countries were, other associate nations coming together and seeing how our players compared to theirs was very eye-opening. And how do you feel the USA players, whether it's yourself or Sindhu Shriharsha, compared to what you were seeing on the field I'd say we were pretty good and there was a lot of similarities that we've seen with Associate Nations and USA and there's always a lot to go. I mean, Thailand is one that we're, we always constantly remind ourselves of. They made it to the World Cup and the, their story of how they made it to there is very inspiring. So that's something that all of us, all of the Associate Nations are probably having in mind and working towards. 
on that point, as a follow-up, Thailand is a team that USA played in a warm-up match, the Women's World Cup qualifier in Scotland. They didn't play in a qualifying match, but they were a team that USA came up against in the warm-up games, and they beat USA quite handily. They scored 124 for four, and then USA was restricted to 66 for seven. And that was right at the start of the qualifying journey. So this is before it kind of they exploded and got the notoriety upon qualifying for the World Cup and then going to Australia itself for the T20 World Cup. You guys got some very, very early insight into what they were doing ahead of a lot of other people in the world. What stood out to you most, seeing them live, up close, and in person? It was very eye-opening. I know I've been using that word word a lot, but just seeing them on the field, they were very loud on the field. They played cricket, I'd say, almost in a textbook manner. They were just sticking to the basics, trusting the process, and in the end, they did outperform us that match. And I'd say it's very inspiring for us, just learning that, well, in USA, the country is very big, so we all don't practice together as much as other associate nations do, and we come together for camps. So I think making sure that we get a lot more playing time together and build as a team would be something that would help us emulate what Thailand has been doing and get us to the World Cup faster. And then after that experience going to Australia, then the pandemic hits, and it it threw a wrench into a lot of the plans for USA at all levels, men, women, junior. In terms of virtual learning, it was tough being away from being able to learn inside a classroom during the pandemic. But because you were doing school from home, it also allowed you to dedicate more time and be able to have more efficient training sessions in terms of cricket. What, over the course of the last 18 months or so during the pandemic, have you been focusing on specifically and been able to dedicate more time to in order to step up your game and and kind of close the gap, whether it's with other teammates in the national team or close the gap with other players on the opposite side of the field that are going to be USA opponents? During the pandemic, I've been going pretty hard at fitness, making sure that I'm staying up there in terms of my speed, agility, my bowling speed, batting, uh, making sure I can run those runs without getting mentally fatigued. And I think Bert's um, fitness program that he makes, he provides to the athletes is very helpful in terms of that. It helped me stay on track and constantly setting goals for myself. That's something we talk about a lot on the team. But the pandemic, just working towards the goals that I set, whether it's like learning how to play a new shot or working on playing the same shots that I know, but placing them in the gaps or bowling a different variation of slower ball and stuff like that is something that really kept me going. And I think that helped me close the gap within my teammates and other associate players. One of the things specifically that I've noticed in terms of a progression in your game that has really stood out to me over and above the the batting and the bowling improvements, which have also been significant, is your fielding. And I think the best indication of that is when I was in North Carolina for the Women's uh, Eastern Conference Tournament, you could hear players having conversations or coaches or other officials, and they would say, well, if Gitika was there, that would have been caught. Or if Gitika was fielding there, that would have been a catch. If Gitika was there, that wouldn't have been dropped. That would have been out. So what have you done to improve from a good level to a much higher level where you're at now? It's basically the facilities, the grounds here. The grass is a lot shorter compared to what I was playing in in California. That was like ankle height, the ball. The fielder was like best fielder of every game. The ball would stop before coming to us. So just being able to practice at Church Street, get some fielding practice with the U17 team or the U15 team at every single practice, we warm up with long, like high catches, throwing and stuff like that. So I think the facilities, the coaches, and just the amount of time that I put into fielding dramatically expanded due to the pandemic. I had a lot more time to work on every aspect of cricket. I started doing fielding sessions, like sessions only for fielding, instead of adding it on to the end of a batting or bowling session. So just addressing or giving more importance to fielding. I know cricket's a game where most people get importance through batting and bowling, but in the end, all 11 have to be able to field. 
You're giving a, a, a big grin, a big smile right now. You, you've been talking with a lot of enthusiasm about cricket throughout this conversation. And it sounds like it just comes through your voice. You just sound like you have a lot of fun and a lot of enjoyment in cricket. What gives you the most fun and the most satisfaction of playing cricket? Probably ticking off that box after you accomplish a little goal, like getting a four-wicket haul, getting a five-wicket haul, taking that one catch that you never expected you would be able to take. I think those little accomplishments keep me going. They're definitely something I love to celebrate and even if I'm not or if I'm going through a rough patch or not accomplishing a lot those goals are always there to keep me working and keep me staying on top of my game so that I can achieve them as soon as possible. Obviously the near-term goal for the women's national team and you're part of the squad in the overall setup is to beat Canada, beat Argentina, beat Brazil qualify out of the Americas region and progress on to global qualifying for the T20 World Cup. And you've also got the 50 over World Cup qualifier coming up that is still currently scheduled to be held in December. The big picture goal is to qualify for World Cup. What do you think needs to be done in terms of squad development or your own personal contributions in order to make that happen, considering that the last qualifier in Scotland and the last 50 over qualifier back a decade ago, USA was not really competitive with some of the other top associate teams like a Thailand or, or even to a lesser extent of Scotland or Papua New Guinea. Definitely coming together more often, uh, having more training camps or developmental camps and bring, making sure everyone's in the same place while that's happening it really helps with team bonding and it helps us improve as a team a lot faster than if we were just uh, practicing locally and coming together every two or so months and maybe some like bilateral series or some friendly competition series between other associate nations would definitely help us improve our game also so those two things would definitely help us reach the point where we are a threatening country to play you mentioned earlier that you're somebody who sets goals. One of your first goals was getting to the national team within three years. What are some of your other long-term goals, five years, 10 years down the road, or just over the course of an extended career? What do you hope to achieve playing for USA? My personal goals would definitely be becoming a, or contributing more on the USA women's team. I'd like to be that bowler that the captain can count on or the batsman that everyone's talking about as you walk onto the field. Personally, I'd also like to play in other tournaments, like Fair Break was the perfect starting point for me, and playing in the WBBL or the Kia Super League, the Women's IPL in India, that would be a dream come true for me, and that's actually the goal that I'm working towards right now. And then Team USA-wise, I think our goal, or our long-term goal, would be to lift the World Cup. And... <laughs> That's a goal that we're all working towards right now. All right, Geetika, time for the Favorite 11. Before we get to the Favorite 11, I want to remind everybody that the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast is presented by Dream Cricket. Dream Cricket's pavilion shop can help you fill up all of your cricket kit requirements from top-of-the-line English wool bats made by all the top manufacturers, as well as helmets, gloves, pads, jerseys, highlight DVDs, books, and more. Get 10% off all orders over $400 using coupon code DCUSA. That's DCUSA. Go to shop.dreamcricket.com to take advantage of that offer today. Dream Cricket Academy is located at 400 Apgar Drive in Somerset, New Jersey, just a mile off of Exit 12 on Interstate 287. For more information, call 908-938-3787 or email cricket at dreamcricket.com. Ready to rock and roll, Geetika. Your favorite roommate on any cricket tour. It could be a USA tour. It could be a non-USA national team tour. Who's your favorite roommate you've been paired with? Uh, probably Sindhu Sriharsha. You're going to score a lot of points. Name of the captain is your favorite roommate. Tell us why. Why is Sindhu Sriharsha your favorite roommate? I think our relationship has really grown from the starting. I was so intimidated of her when I first got selected for the team. And now it's like WhatsApping about random TV shows. So... I think we grew closer after we've been roommates. I roomed with her twice, actually. Um, for fair break, I roomed with her, and I roomed with her for the qualifiers against Canada, where I first debuted. 
And she's also, she brings me cookies from the lobby when I ask. <laughs> Your favorite thing to do to pass the time on a 14 hour flight from California to Australia? Watching Netflix. I wish that was something I could have done instead of SAT prep or homework. <laughs> Your favorite cricket ground experience that you've had as a player or as a fan and that includes the quality of the pitches the quality of the outfields just the overall scenery of the cricket ground the training facilities the lunches anything that goes into a cricket match experience what's the favorite place you've been to for a cricket match anywhere in the world that would probably be the barrel ground in australia when i went to fair break i got to play at that ground but fan wise we went to lords as the USA women's team. And I didn't see any cricket matches happening over there, but just the sheer size of the Lord's uh, ground was just so eye-opening and amazing to see. And hopefully one day we'll be playing there and there will be crowds in the stadium. Your favorite place to eat out on tour I'd say Olive Garden for restaurants and Taco Bell for something you got to pick up and go home fast. Your favorite cricketer of all time? Elise Perry. I think the way like her hard work and her dedication shows throughout her game and she's just someone I've been looking forward, I mean looking up to for a long time. Your favorite non-cricket athlete of all time? Uh, that would probably be Steph Curry. I'm not a very big watcher of sports, but back when I lived in California, I did go to a couple of Warriors games for basketball, and Steph Curry was always the one I was looking at on that in that stadium. Your favorite pizza topping? Onions. I love onions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you a Coke or a Pepsi person? Coke over Pepsi, but I don't drink either a lot. <laughs> That's all right. You said you said Coke. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter how often. If you could not play for the USA national team in cricket, which other sport would you most want to represent the USA national team in? Probably softball would be the sport that I would. And I think it's really close to cricket in terms of the way other people look at it. So USA softball. Your favorite movie of all time? Um, my favorite movie is probably Up. It's a childhood movie, and I've watched it a countless number of times, so never fails to amuse. Your favorite show to binge watch, whether it's on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, Paramount Plus, what's your go-to show that if you're stuck in quarantine or you're, you're stuck somewhere else, you you can't get enough of it and it helps you pass the time? Uh, Grey's Anatomy. I'm a proud Grey's Anatomy 17 season uh, fan. I have not rewatched it, but I uh, love every single episode and it always makes me pass time. What now? What did you get into Grey's Anatomy? Again, you just said 17 years show. You're 17. So you, you were barely born when the show first started on the air. <laughs> How did you get into it? I think I just it was just one of those shows that was in the top 10 for Netflix and I just gave it a shot and I'm I stuck with it all 17 seasons, and my family even joined me for the first couple of seasons. They couldn't take any more after the first six or so. I'll give you the last word, Kitika. Thank you so much for coming on the show, but floor is yours. Anything you want to say that you feel people should know about you? Well, first off, thank you for having me, and I think I just take this time to say thank you to all of my coaches, um, supporters, teammates, friends, and my parents. I can't thank them enough. And yeah, thank you to everyone. I wouldn't be here where I am without you guys. And I'd love to see where I can go. Well, there you have it from Geetika Kadali, one of the youngest players in the national team, part of the new wave of up and coming next generation talents trying to help USA qualify for the next T20 Women's World Cup and the next 50 Over World Cup. USA has a pair of qualifiers on tap later in 2021. I want to remind everybody to support the podcast on Patreon. If you haven't joined on Patreon, go to patreon.com and you can be an eagle, a patriot to help keep the podcast running. And 
I'd also remind everybody to subscribe to the show on YouTube, Spotify, Anchor FM, and Apple Podcasts. That's all for this week's episode. I'm Peter Delapena reminding everybody, God bless America, and God bless American Cricket. Cricket.